So what happens is this kundalini energy will rise through the body. It will enlighten each of our chakras, including our third eye chakra and our crown chakra. By illuminating our third eye chakra, this will in turn blow open or explode our crown chakra. And this is symbolized often like this or like this with the Indian chief and his head of feathers. He may be wearing snakeskin boots as well to have the snakes below and the feathers above. But this is a representation of his crown chakra being blown open. A full open chakra system. And this happens often in different traditions. Here we see this woman here with the book of the law and her crown chakra system being depicted here as fully open with a shell. On this side we have the intertwined columns on either side representing the caduceus with the shell up above representing the wings or the blown open crown chakra. So in many cultures we will see the feathers over the head uh, symbolizing the crown chakra. Um, in the Pentecost, the story of the Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down onto man and rests over the head of the people in the temple as a flame over their heads. So this flame now, the Holy Spirit, is representing the crown chakra. Here's the bird again over the head of this prophet or this teacher. He is fully illuminated with the Holy Spirit. And here we have Mary in, in the temple with the men of the temple and uh, we can see the fire, the flame over each one of their heads. It's interesting to point out here what the artist has done. This is a cult artwork again. Mary here is representing the pillar and this canopy is the cap of a mushroom. Here are the striations or the gills the people in the temple representing the base of the mushroom and the dots that may form around the veil. So even here Mary is with her scarf or her shawl as the universal veil of the mushroom. Another interesting point about this is this arch of the mushroom is also the great arch in the sky of the sun. So this arch has a dualistic meaning as well. This is where we come with the term archbishop and architecture. So 49 days after the Immaculate Conception is Pentecost. Gautama meditated underneath a tree for 49 days, after which he became the Buddha. The embryo on the 49th day after conception technically becomes the fetus. So there is a 49-day period. It happens over and over again, and it also happens within our human body. Here is the human fetus at 49 days. The human fetus is not a fetus before this. It is an embryo. So on this day, we, we actually become a human. So what happens on the 49th day that causes the embryo to become a fetus is that the pineal gland or the third eye literally floods the brain and floods the body of the embryo with DMT or dimethyltryptamine which is this powerful entheogen that we've been talking about. So on the 49th day it is suggested that that is the day that the soul actually enters into the body. This is the first day that the fetus can actually be considered alive. It's, it's almost as if this host body was created for us, but we aren't there yet. It's common for a Buddhist to recite from the Tibetan Book of the Dead for 49 days after the loss of a loved one as their soul passes through the bardo. This is something that Christians may, re or may recognize as purgatory, this period of time after death uh, before the next stage. So we have this 49-day period where we are not a human but the host human body has been created and on this 49th day our spirit will enter into this deciding what sex it will be the fingers and toes begin to develop the eyelids begin to form and close so this is a very important day for us here we have Dr. Rick Strassman's book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, a doctor's revolutionary research into the biology of near-death and mystical experiences now Dr. Strassman he was actually the first doctor allowed to do psychedelic or entheogenic studies in the U.S. in 20 years uh, at the time that this research began. And uh, he conducted the research at the University of New Mexico. It took many years to get the permits and begin the research itself. But one of the many things that Dr. Strassman discovered while doing research on DMT and other entheogens is that he was actually able to replicate the alien abduction experience in the laboratory as well as many levels of out-of-body experiences and and other things as well so here again is our meditating man with his chakra system being opened by the kundalini energy and up here on his head above the third eye and in between the crown chakra we have wings on the head and we actually do have wings in our head this is the corpus callosum and it rests right in the center of our brain 
Uh, this is responsible for transferring data back and forth from one hemisphere of the brain to the other. But it looks like wings sitting right on top of our spinal column. So we do have wings on top of our staff. And this energy will climb that staff. And this is what will fill full of this psychedelic material, DMT, and saturate the brain. Here again is this third eye system representing the eye of Horus, the eye of Ra, and the third eye chakra. An interesting thing to note about the eye of Ra is that it was literally pulled from the head of Horus. So now we can begin to understand where the symbol of the eye of Ra came from. It is literally your third eye inside your brain. So Horus was the sun god, and as we've been saying, there was this macrocosm, microcosm belief system. So Horus was the sun, and the third eye in the, macro, in the microcosm was the drug god, or, or symbolize a, a dualistic symbology between the two belief systems. So then we come to the unidentified object. What is this? Is this a UFO? Is this alien? Or is this something else? We're told in the Bible that manna was called, what is this? As if you would eat this and say, what is this? We don't know what happens after we ingest this, but we have a good idea as to what may be happening. These mushrooms are psilocybin-containing mushrooms. These aren't the amanita, as we discussed earlier. These are different, but they are the same uh, in the realm of entheogens. These are both entheogens, or sacred plants. This mushroom will open your third eye system. The amanita muscaria mushroom will take you out of body. So a combination of these two plants will take you out of body with an open chakra system. Here's the psilocybin mushroom again, but we see the bottom of the mushroom is turning blue. When you uh, grab a hold of these mushrooms and uh, bruise them, they bruise blue, sim similar to a magnolia tree, the flower bruising brown. These mushrooms bruise blue. So here we have psilocybin. Psilocybin is the active ingredient in psilocybin or cubensis types of mushrooms. And psilocybin is composed of O-phosphoryl-4-hydroxy-inindimethyltryptamine, or DMT. And uh, an interesting thing about psilocybin is, is this phosphoryl. Phosphoryl is phosphor or phosphorescence. Phosphorescence is emission of light without burning. So we have the emission of light or, or light coming from the mind, coming from the phosphoryl in the dimethyltryptamine. Now, Terence McKenna, he was a famous philosopher, researcher, scientist, mathematician, wrote several books as well as created many uh, mathematical theories from uh, concepts of time to wormholes and time travel and, and many different things, but his primary research was that around entheogens and shamanism, and he wrote a book called Food of the Gods, uh, suggesting that human consciousness and the development of human of what is humanness may have actually been started by mushrooms or by entheogens being the catalyst propelling us into a, a state of awareness of who we are today. So one of the things that Terence McKenna discovered is that these psilocybin mushrooms contain something not found anywhere else in the plant or animal kingdom or anywhere else on earth and that is the 4-hydroxy. Now what's interesting to know is that Mushroom spores and, and, and different stages of mushroom life happen to be the only thing that can survive uh, existence in space without any machinery or anything to survive. And we, all, we can all remember the Russian space station Mir being shut down because it was attacked by space mold. Well, here we have this, this alien substance in a fungus. We know that fungus can survive through space and can survive reentry and as well live in outer space. So the only place that we find for hydroxy is in a mushroom, which is very interesting to contemplate the idea that maybe the mushrooms themselves are the aliens that we seek because as Dr. Rick Strassman discovered, he was able to reproduce the alien abduction experience in the laboratory with entheogenic substances. So here we have this with psilocybin, we have the O-phosphoryl 4-hydroxy and N-dimethyl tryptamine. We have the DMT, the most potent psychedelic substance known to man. We have an alien substance that is unknown to man, and we have a light-emitting substance. So the theory is, is that maybe these are alien communication. If, if we're going to spend so much time and so much effort and money searching the stars for aliens, it would 
be wise to search the plant life and the fungus on the earth that is already here as well. More interesting research can be found in Jeremy Narby's book, The Cosmic Serpent, in which he discusses the possibility of how the infusions allow the human body or the human mind to somehow communicate with other animals and species through some sort of connection with the DNA helix, which is also very similar in design to the caduceus itself. So it's very possible that uh, s someone, something, somewhere has encoded data into these mushrooms, and by ingesting these mushrooms, we can interpret this data. We know that uh, ants lay pheromone trails, and they encode information in a scent that other ants can determine where to go uh, uh, and what to do. So we're suggesting that, that these mushrooms are like interspecies pheromones that can give us information from somewhere in the cosmos.